Welcome everyone to the 2022 CEPR Economic Summit. I'm Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and it's a gigantic honor to be hosting this year's Economic Summit. All of our speakers and panelists are here to shine a light on the policy and business decisions that have come in response to the unprecedented challenges and seismic shifts in the world's economy during the past two years. Let me start by thanking the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and especially you, Mark, uh, for inviting me to participate in today's event. CEPR has an impressive track record of supporting high quality, impactful economic policy research. And it's an honor to be part of your economic summit. The pandemic laid bare what was an underlying reality, which is the, the goods movement system as a system was straining in the best of times. It was showing its seams uh, in the best of times. And when you add uh, a 20% increase on top of that of goods movement, it simply couldn't cope. So uh, it, it wasn't a failure. It was a series of failures. Are we going to see self-driving trucks in the next 10, 20 years? Is, is that maybe one of the solutions to the supply chain crisis? On self-driving, yes, we will see self-driving. Yes, it will be commercially deployed, but it will take time. And I think this is going to be a hybrid uh, futures. What's been really amazing, I would say, over the last 25 years is, yes, the world has gotten hard. It's harder and harder to make the same advances that, uh, that you were able to make you know, a few decades ago. But engineers are incredibly, you know, sort of capable and really creative and really innovative. And we've been able to continue this curve where you can get more performance per dollar, more capability in each semiconductor chip. And so when you look today in 2019, uh, we're still saying it's hard, but we're putting like an incredible amount of horsepower um, on a single chip, right? What used to be a supercomputer 10 years ago is now like in your PlayStation. My conclusion is, in a nutshell, that the Common Prosperity Program in China is a bumper sticker. It is important because it recognizes that income inequality is very high. It's a matter of greater and greater popular concern. And so they put out this program calling Common Prosperity to give the impression that the government is actually doing something about it. In reality, I think it's a slogan. There are very few policies that are actually achieving common prosperity in China. Of course, common prosperity is a long-term goal and maybe the ultimate goal. Um, but I think to achieve that goal, I think there are a few things policymaker needs to get right. Humanity is really at a crossroads in many fronts. And we want to be able to help create the next generation of problem solvers to meet those challenges. And our goal is really to be able to inspire folks um, to use technology for social good. All of the wealth creation is going to have, be happening, or most of it is going to be happening in, in the knowledge economy. And so you're either going to have to do massive redistribution if most people aren't put, participating in the knowledge economy, that's not a good outcome, or you get as many people into the knowledge economy as possible. And I would argue the only way you can do that is mastery learning. You know, I have a weird entry into this. I started working on work, working from home back in 2004. And it was a very quiet, you know, backwater topic, I'd guess. You know, Odesk had been doing this for quite a while, actually. They were very, uh, very much in the vanguard of this. And then obviously in March 2020, it just exploded. So, you know, I went from spending 5% of my time thinking about this to probably about 80%. When you ask women, like, what kind of flexibility do you want? They want flexibility both, especially with time. I mean, location, yes, but especially with time. They want to be able to say like, I'm not going to be available in the afternoon from two to four on Wednesdays because I have, you know, a commitment. It could be elder care, child care, whatever. So they want some more flexibility in time. So I, I think it's entirely possible to say, look, we'd like people to work five days a week if we pay you commensurate for that. Um, but they want, they want some flexibility, autonomy, and respect. Let's just step back to, you know, the first onset of the pandemic. This could have turned out much, 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 much worse by a lot. And the fact that policymakers acted so aggressively, you know, disproportionately aggressively in the US, but pretty aggressively across the board in most of the industrialized world made a massive difference in, in people's lives. We learned pretty early on that that COVID, you know, mercifully really tended to spare children. They were not at as severe risk. And yet we did not prioritize getting kids back to school in any meaningful way. And I think that 
is going to be one of the biggest policy failures of this pandemic era. It's going to have one of the, mo- the longest lasting scarring effects. We need a fiscal consolidation. You know, we, we basically, it's time to fix the entitlements in a bipartisan way, create like in present value, a massive uh, 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 savings in the long run debt budget situation so that people have a great deal of faith in uh, the debt situation, the long run debt trajectory of the United States. Thank you again so much for all of your support. Our work in addressing and analyzing the biggest economic policy challenges isn't easy, but it is made possible in very, very large part by you and by our entire community. So thanks again, everybody.